Okay, we're live now. Cool. All right. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Well, welcome to Photo Jam again. And then I have to thank uh, Stephen for bringing Roy in. Uh. Roy is actually uh, based in Malaysia now. I think for he said for the past uh, four years at least. It's, and uh, um, it's this uh, macro photography is something that he took up when he came to Malaysia. I let let Roy like you know tell his story. Yeah. So Roy, uh, when you're ready, you can share your screen, and then we'll sit back and try not to be too frightened by your spider. Sounds good. Okay, let me know if you can see my screen and uh, if that's all working properly. Can uh, can everyone see my screen or? No, not yet. Not oh, okay. Yet. okay. No. Okay. Let's see, do I need to click something? I'm such a Zoom noob. Like you yeah. think I would have gotten more experience with it, but you know, apparently I don't <laughs> set up that many meetings. <laughs> Oh, okay. I think if I do that, okay, does that work? Yes. Oh, yeah. oh, good. Okay. Okay. All right. Great. Excellent. Okay. And just to check, can you see my cursor if I wanted to point it? Yes, stuff? we can see yes. cursor. Great. Great. That's fantastic. Okay. Let's get started. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So just to get us, get us started off here. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me on uh, to give you this talk. And uh, thank you to Stephen for introducing me to this group. And I'm uh, really thrilled to be here. I uh, really appreciate your uh, your interest and uh, allowing me to share my photography with you. So there's going to be a couple of apologies first. Um, my first apology is for my hair, which is getting extremely long at this point. Uh, I'm this these lockdowns just won't seem to end, and um, it's it's just getting completely out of control. So if anyone knows a barber, please help me out. Send them over here. At stat. <laughs> um, and my second uh, apology is that. Uh, when I was trying to put this uh, presentation together, it was really hard to decide how I was going to try and order it. You know, was it going to be like, okay, here's all my snake pictures, here's all my spider pictures, and then, well, wait, I kind of want to do arthropods and then, you know, reptiles and separate separate them. But then I wanted to show like my kind of progress. So this is my story in photography from start to end, and here's all the pictures in chronological order. And I think I I kind of did both at, without succeeding at either. So I'm, I'm kind of as interested as you are to see what's in this presentation because it got really confusing and I just started throwing pictures in here. So uh, we're just gonna go live and we're just gonna see how it goes. So yeah, thank you for, thank you for joining us. So um, let me see if I can get this to switch. So yeah, as you can see, uh, I'm interested in nature and macro photography. And I think if there was one picture that kind of summed up uh, the majority of my work in this area, it's it's probably this picture. So right here, we're looking at an Asian ant mantis. Uh, so it's obviously a praying mantis, uh, just sitting on a leaf in a, in a kind of a, with a very blurry background. And this is generally like the kind of thing that I aim to get. So um, I use, ten, I tend to use a very wide aperture and I get like very blurry backgrounds. And then of course, I always try to get the subject. Uh, it's usually just one subject in the fore of the photograph. Uh, and then what you're going to notice about these pictures is that there's like two people inside of me and there's two, these are two separate hobbies. It's like there's, one, there's a part of me that's a photographer and a part of me that's a naturalist. A naturalist is someone who takes an academic interest in nature. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let the photographer tell you what the picture, what I did for the picture, how I got the picture. And then the other part of me is going to be telling you that this is an Asian ant mantis and that in their juvenile stages, you know, in their adult stages, they're just a normal green uh, praying mantis. They look very, you know, kind of like a general praying mantis. But in their juvenile stages, they're, uh, they mimic an ant. So they're actually a very interesting insect. And as you can see, this one has a black uh, body. Some of them are actually red. So they mimic different species of ants. I'm trying to remember what the Latin name for that in biology is. It's like myrmececolophily or myrmecomorphy. That's the one. Yeah. So there's actually quite a few subjects in here that are going to be displaying Rebecca Morphy. Uh, that, so I find that really interesting and uh, I hope you do too. So let me try and start right back at the beginning. Uh, over here on the right is a picture of me as a kid uh, catching frogs in, in my, uh, my family farm. And then here on the left is me as an adult still looking at nature and uh, at, this, at this point frogs. Uh, so I, I've been interested in bugs and 
like for as long as I can remember. I mean, I think as soon as I learned how to walk, I was in the back garden, like digging up rocks and looking under logs and uh, looking at all kinds of bugs. Uh, in fact, in my family, there's a famous story that we tell uh, at dinner time, uh, which is that when I was a kid and I played baseball, uh, whenever the ball was hit and it went over to the back of the, uh, the outfield where I was like meant to catch it, the whole crowd would have to shout, Roy, get the ball, because I was too busy looking at the ants running around on the ground. Uh, so, so this this obsession with, with with nature and bugs goes back a really long way, as far as I can remember. And um, it's kind of surprising to me that it took moving to Malaysia and being here for two years before I remembered that that was something I was interested in. So this all really started about two years. This has all really been going on like two years. Uh, when I moved to Malaysia in 2018, I started going diving again. So I would go to Tiaman Island and I was the usual, you know, GoPro idiot. So I would be underwater, like with my little GoPro, like making videos. And then after a dive trip or two of that, I realized that one, uh, I'm not, I only want to like watch videos of sea turtles so many times before I get bored. And then two, I don't actually like editing video and then uploading it to YouTube and getting like 10 views. I mean, I just... No one, no one cares about your your diving GoPro video unless unless you see a blue whale or something. So, I kind of started to realize that I was actually a lot more interested in the smaller things that were going on the diving. So, then I got go I got my GoPro a magnifying glass that you attach the front, and then I got some interesting still images of nudibranches branches uh, at a higher resolution than I'd ever been able to get before. And then I realized I was way more interested in the still images and. Uh, I decided to get a camera. So the, the best underwater kind of camera, unless you get like a full rig, is really the Olympus TG5. So that was my first ever, you know, proper camera that I ever uh, started with. So you can see here on the right, um, not only am I holding the underwater camera, I'm holding like a torch, which is how you do underwater macro photography. And this is in a place called Dwara Beach, uh, which is a really good spot for macro. And the dive masters there are really specialized in that. Uh, underwater macro photography. I've actually put one of my friends forward to do a talk on underwater macro uh, called Mel. So, um, you know, definitely Melanie Hua, when, when she oh, yes. does her talk, um, I really recommend it because she's she actually leads a lot of these trips. And I think she's going to show you some some images that are going to blow your mind. So my start was in underwater macro photography. And then you can see here on the left, um, I actually started taking my, my dive equipment, like the dive lights out into the jungle. Uh, when I discovered Stephen's, uh, you know, uh, jungle walks in, at night, uh, I started going on those. And I, like, like a total noob, I was just taking my, my dive equipment into the jungle. And I actually got some okay pictures from that. But that was kind of how I, I started getting eased into this uh, kind of photography. One thing I really like about how I started uh, is that the kind of the underwater macro scene is they're really into like abstract pictures. And they're very experimental. Like the community there is like really open to um, trying different colors of lights or trying to get like a specific kind of bokeh or uh, they're really experimental. So I, I'm really grateful that like the first like thing I, I, I got into was was like the experimenting with, with photography was OK. And that's that, that still influences me today. And I'll, I'll show you some examples later that uh, where it kind of influenced me. Anyway, so all of this was starting to really get going and I was really getting into this stuff. Uh, and then I found this picture on the internet and this picture, this is not my picture. I just wanna, I'm not taking credit for this. This is a, a picture of a jumping spider by a guy called Thomas Shahan. And I, I was really struck by it. Like it really, it was basically everything that I had been trying to do for the last four or five months at that point. And this is what I was trying to do. And so the more I looked into this, I, I, I was trying to figure out what equipment did I need for that. So I actually carried, and by the way, Thomas Shahan is an amazing macro photographer. Uh, his, his work is, is exceptional. You should definitely go and check it out. But this is basically, this was it. I wanted to do this. I, it, the light bulb was on and there was no turning back. So then I, I spent like six months watching, um, you know, YouTube video after YouTube video, trying to, I totally starting from scratch. I didn't know anything about photography. And then what I came to, and this is my setup uh, that I use in the jungle. And after a lot of research, uh, I'm an Olympus zealot. So um, I use Olympus. And I think Olympus, especially uh, my camera, which is the OMD EM5 Mark III, 
uh, Olympus is really good for macro. Um, it uses a micro four thirds sensor, uh, which, you know, in typical photography fashion, it's like everything's confusing. Like micro four thirds, like what, what does that even mean? I don't know. Anyway, I, I'm not like a numbers guy. I'm, I'm very much like I learned by, by example. But uh, the mac micro four thirds is smaller than a full frame camera. And uh, for macro, the smaller your sensor is, the greater the depth of field you will get um, in comparison with a full frame. The other great thing about the micro four thirds in the Olympus OMD system is that it has a built in uh, focus stacking um, like mechanism. So I actually have my camera set up. So I just press one button and it switches to focus stacking. And I can then just set my camera as still as I can get it or on a tripod or similar, and I can do focus stacking uh, right without even breaking into uh, different uh, modes of cameras or whatever. Uh, for Olympus, if you're going to do macro, there's really only one lens that you need, and that's the uh, 60 mil macro lens. So because this is a micro four thirds, uh, the whole system is a lot smaller than a full frame camera. I actually have a lot of friends that do macro and do a full frame. And I mean, their camera setups uh, for macro are, you could like break a door down with them, they look like, you know, so I, I think trying to hike through the jungle, climb over trees, uh, abseil down cliffs with, with a huge full frame. I don't, I just, I think this is a much better system for it. You get some fantastic shots. In fact, the 60 mil macro lens, uh, not only does great macro, I, I have some pretty good pictures of orangutans, which I didn't put in this presentation, unfortunately, but you know, it does, it does like snakes, it does orangutans, it does um, fleas. I mean, you can take, it does almost everything. So with the 60 mil macro, which is a 90 mil equivalent for full frame, uh, you can go up to about one to one magnification. So for any, anyone who's watching who's not like uh, experienced with these kinds of numbers, that means the size of the subject is the same as the size of the subject on the sensor. Um, and by the way, maybe this is a good, a good point to explain why it's called macro. Um, a lot of people are like, aren't you taking pictures of small things? Why is it called macro? Surely it's called, should be called micro. Well, actually what you're doing in macro is you are taking the subject and you are magnifying it on the screen. So that's actually a macro effect. But with normal photography, you're taking a big thing and then you're shrinking it to the sensor. So that's, my, that's more of a micro effect. Uh, so, but as with everything in photography, it's all backwards and upside down and left is right, up is down. Uh, and I think that photographers do that on purpose to keep the noobs out and like try to make, keep it like an elite thing. So uh, that's just my theory. But uh, yeah, so that's the basic setup, the, the EM5, the 60 mil macro lens. And then uh, on top of that, I have a, a filter, the Raynox DCR250, which uh, thank you, Stephen, for, for pointing me to this because it, it really, it, it brought everything up to a whole new level. This brings the one to one uh, scale factor to a one to 2.5. So now I can, I can like zoom in all the way down to the the eyelashes on a, on a jumping spider now. And um, so that, that, that gets me to the level of macro that I felt like I was finally, this is where I, where I was trying to get to. And by the way, none of this is, is like straightforward. I mean, I had to watch, you know, YouTube videos and track down articles. Like there's really no guides about this anywhere. You have to kind of piece it together yourself. Um, so then on top of that, so you have the camera, you have the lens and you have your, your magnifying filter. But it's really important that you get your light correct. I think actually, the more I get into this, the more I think that that probably applies for all photography, no matter what you're doing. And so for macro photography, we have filters uh, and we have diffusers. Uh, let me see if I can choose virtual background. And when I go up here, I think I can go to none and then great. And then I can pull out my, my actual camera here. So if you look in the... Um, in the little video here, you can actually see this is my diffuser. Uh, this is made by MK Diffusers. You can find them on Instagram. Uh, they're, they're really good. I'm, I've been very happy with it. And what it is, is like it's a semi-transparent uh, white plastic. So when your flash um, goes, it's not harsh light. It's, it's very diffused. It's very soft. The whole, you, with macro, you really need like as soft as possible. You know, the light needs to travel through as much uh, material as it can before it gets there. And then you also have this detachable uh, hood, which can go underneath and then you have less shadow. It's like creates like a much more even cone of light around your subject. I mean, there, so I, I don't know what it's like for other schools of photography, but I mean, macro is like, it's got like entire philosophies on, on exactly how to do your lighting and um, what you need to do and how the right and the wrong way. And 
I mean, there's just, it's a really detailed uh, thing. And um, another great feature about the MK diffuser is that it's got a uh, focus light, which I'm uh, having trouble making it work. But this really helps because when you have a hood on your camera, you know, it stops you from being able to focus on your subject. So lots of uh, particulars about getting your uh, macro photography set up. Um, so I just have the, for flash, uh, I always have it set to manual um, and it's the V350 flash, uh, which is really handy because Steven also uses Godox flashes. And then when we go out into the jungle together, we can both have the same remote trigger, which means that um, we can fire each other's flashes through uh, the Triopo diffuser softbox uh, here on the right. So the softbox um, is really good for larger subjects. So like something like a turtle or um, you know, a snake, something like that size, uh, using the softbox gives an incredible light. Uh, you get really, really soft and even. And you can imagine for something like a snake, um, you know, the scales are very shiny or the carapace of like a larger insect uh, gets really shiny. So the softer the light, the better. Uh, it's really important for macro. So that's my equipment setup. And then here are my camera settings. Uh, this is my secret sauce. No, I'm joking. Um, so, you know, really, it's very straightforward. I shoot in manual. Uh, my shutter speed is linked to my flash, uh, flash bulb speed. So that's one over 250 uh, at all times, pretty much. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm an ISO Nazi, so I always have mine set to the absolute minimum value. Uh, I've done some experiments in my, my, my laboratory, uh, trying to put the ISO up and down. And I just always find that like, I need it at minimum. Otherwise I notice the noise and it bothers me. So I, I rarely ever change the ISO to anything else. So really all that leaves is aperture. That's really all I'm playing around with. And since aperture uh, is linked to flash power, I'm really just adjusting uh, my aperture from maybe 4.5 to f13 uh, using the macro uh, 60 mil from uh, Olympus. Um, as, as probably all of you professional, real, all of you real photographers, not hobbyists like me will know, um, aperture always has a sweet spot. So every lens has kind of its own sweet spot for, you know, the more detail you get, uh, you get more detail at a certain aperture than you do at like maybe a higher aperture. So for my lens, it really is around f7. And then beneath that, you actually get pretty good detail as well. Uh, but f13 is really as high as I really like to go. Um, so here's an example of how that aperture can affect the picture that you get at the end. So here on top is a Porsche jumping spider. I'll be talking all about these later. Don't you worry about that. Um, and you can see that I've used like quite a wide aperture. And so again, photography, everything's backwards. A wide aperture means a small F number and a short aperture means a, a larger F number for anyone uh, listening in who doesn't maybe know these things. And then down here is an example of where I've got a, uh, like maybe a higher F number. And this is a giraffe, uh, giraffe weevil here from Malaysia. So these are really the two things I'm, I'm really playing with for, for my pictures. Um, so the other thing that affects the kind of depth of field is uh, how far away you are from the, from the, from the subject. So, um, you know, I might use a wide aperture, but then I'll move my camera back physically away uh, to increase the working distance. And that gives me uh, more resolution or uh, more depth of field. So you can see down here, you can get all of the, de the details of this weevil. Whereas in the top here, it's like very blurry and abstract. So it's really, for me, a lot of it's playing with like how much abstract do I want in my pictures. Um, I think my next slide, ah, yeah, cool. The next slide, I'll talk about the, the, the camera settings and stuff. But yeah, basically in terms of aperture, this is really the, the two effects that I'm playing with. Um, in terms of how I've set my camera, up, I use back button uh, uh, manual focus. So um, when I look at a subject, um, I can kind of see a blur of it through the viewfinder. And then when I get the blur to about what, what scale I'm, I'm going for, uh, I press the back button, it will focus on the subject and then it's in manual mode. And then, so what I do is I will physically move my body back and forth to get uh, the focus plane to move over the subject because macro, your focus plane is razor thin. So you're really trying to get those eyes in focus and you're trying to um, get the composition correct because um, it's really easy to get uh, blur in, in macro. A lot more so than in street photography. You know, I've actually, I've tried street photography once or twice and. Uh, I really, I was a little disappointed like how 
even the widest aperture, like it was like hardly blurry in my, in, from my experience, because I'm so used to like the blur and macro. Uh, oh, and then I also uh, customized my ISO button to switch to focus stacking. So while I'm sitting there in my in, in position, uh, I can just press the ISO button and then it, it switches to, to focus stacking. And I'll show you some examples of that later. Um, oh, I put like a wish list in here in case anyone from Olympus is watching and maybe they can add this to the to the any software updates in the future. But it would be so nice if um, I could have some kind of setting where um, I can just flick the dial of my aperture and then it would automatically change the flash to a different power setting. Uh, that would make my life a lot easier because right now I have to keep pushing my camera away, adjusting the dial and then going back in. So I lose the subject. Um, it would be so nice as well if I could um, set a button that automatically zooms all the way in to maximum zoom. Uh, there should, there is actually a way to do that in the camera, but it doesn't seem to work for my lens. I don't know anyone from Olympus in the meeting. Um, and then the last thing was that I like my diffuser and I like the, the little cone underneath that gives like very even lighting, but I'm actually, I kind of miss the directional lighting that I'm used to in, in diving photography. So having this torch and having so much control and manipulation is, is such a unique thing uh, in photography, I think in any, any style of photography. And uh, I really find I've missed that. So that's something I'm, I'm gonna look into in future. Oh, another thing I wanted to look into um, that I haven't put here is uh, natural light photography I, or natural light macro photography. I feel like that that must be a holy grail. And I think that I might have to get like a um, way better camera to, to accomplish that, but that's definitely a future goal of mine. Okay, so that gives you an idea of what I'm doing. And then here I can show you uh, an example of, uh, one of one of my photos. This is of a Fintaloides, um, let's see now I'm like, uh, Fintaloides Versicolor there. Uh, jumping spider. And so what I like to do is have, so I, I post all my pictures on Instagram. That's just the easiest and quickest way to share my work with the world. Uh, so I, what I like to do is have this picture. Uh, as you can see, it's, this is kind of what I aim for. It's very uh, like shallow depth of field, uh, very abstract. And I, I also like that it has a really bokehed out blurry background. This is the kind of thing I go for. But then I also uh, I like to have on Instagram, you can swipe and see like more pictures from the set. So I really like the fact that on Instagram, you can share one picture. This is the main picture. And then you can share more from a set. So it gives more context. So I like to take the picture and then I like to show the scale. And I really find that that, at, by the way, not all subjects are this obliging. You know, some of them, uh, in fact, a lot of my pictures, the subject is scurried away before I can get a scale shot. But I always try and get a scale shot. So... Uh, you're going to see my thumb a lot in this presentation, and uh, I think this is definitely the most photogenic thumb you're ever going to see in your life, and I am definitely the best thumb photographer uh, you've, you've ever met, I think, at this point. But yeah, I, I think it gives a lot, it's interesting to me, and I, I think this is uh, interesting, is that taking these extra pictures gives context, and it gives you a sense of scale, because I think looking at this, you know, it looks almost gigantic, or it could be on some kind of abstract digital art, but then seeing this gives you that, that understanding of how tiny this, this world that these things inhabit is. So let's talk more about aperture. I'm actually, this, so this was the first picture that I took uh, that made me understand like where I really wanted to go with, with all of this and, and where I, I really became addicted to that shallow depth of field. And this was like the first two, one or two outings with my new camera and I had no idea what I was doing. And I was just playing around with all the different settings. And then I was like whacking my aperture all the way down to 2.3. And then I got uh, this shot of, um, why can't I remember any of the, the names of these spiders anymore? Fiania bamoensis. This is the Malaysian fighting spider a lot of you will be familiar with. Uh, kids catch them and fight them against each other. And it was kind of eating an ant and then defending itself from, from one, of her, one of her colleagues. And uh, this is kind of like, I think you, you need to embrace your mistakes and don't ever forget to go out there and be exper and experiment. And, come up with crazy ideas and challenge yourself because one of the ways that I kind of found what I like to do is was to just allow myself the the freedom to make tons of mistakes and you know overset like play with the colors in Lightroom and make make different um, changes to the settings and figure out what I was doing the other thing I want to point out while we're here because I can see what the next slide is is if you look on the right of this picture it's just black so with macro photography 
anything that's like not directly under your diffuser or in the flash of your camera uh, is just immediately black. So in, in macro photography, uh, it's ba so I actually get people asking me like, how, how do you get that black? It's so cool. And I'm like, this is the default. This is literally like all macro looks like this unless you want it to look like something else. And so I had my next big insight going out into the jungle, or I guess it was just Buka guessing, I guess, but um, just going for a hike in Buka guessing. Um, I, I kind of, I was taking macro and I stumbled over another macro photographer um, who uh, showed me a robber fly. So now the naturalist in me is gonna take over. And so for those of you who don't know, robber flies are uh, predatory flies that are, they're like the F-16s of the insect world. They'll, they they kind of hang out in little twigs and branches and then they have amazing vision and they can actually jump out and grab insects from midair and then like latch back onto the branch and then, and then eat them. So we actually stumbled over a robber fly in mid meal, which was, you know, it's like bonus points in macro photography. And uh, yeah, things that are bonus points in macro photography is like, if it's pregnant, if you see them mating or if they're eating, like you get, it's like extra points, you know, in, the, in macro photography. But here, here was really interesting because I immediately got my camera out and I, you know, started taking like pictures and I got the one on the left that you see, and I was really happy with that. And then uh, the, the macro photographer, um, Tang, I, I think, yeah, his name is amazing photographer, by the way. Um, he was like, oh, no, 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 don't, don't do that. And he put a leaf behind it. So this, this thing, this fly is just hanging out on a twig and then he put the leaf behind uh, the, the fly. And then you get the, this, this kind of really lovely soft bokeh background. And then that, 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 the light bulb went off and I was like, oh, that's, that's way better than a black background. So mm. part of the trick of macro is getting your, getting your camera, getting a subject, and then kind of having something like someone or maybe you hold like a leaf or something that gives it like a bokeh background. Uh, to get that that effect in it, and that's always what I what I strive for. I don't always get it, but uh, I always prefer the the kind on the right to the one on the left most of the time. So here's an example of where this is a, a crab spider uh, that I saw in uh, some some guy too. Uh, they have really strong fore fore legs, and they they grab their prey uh, when it when it bumps into them. Uh, they're really funny looking as well, so I really like them. Uh, but you can see in the background, I had one of my one of my ma my macro friends holding up a leaf so that I could get that uh, bokeh back that kind of blurry background uh, instead of just a boring uh, black background. You know, I like to joke with Stephen that uh, macro photography is a team sport. So uh, you know, I think nature and photography in general is as well. So that's some examples of um, getting getting that effect, and then the things you have to do in macro to get uh, certain specific kind of pictures. So then I spoke earlier about uh, focus stacking. So for people that maybe aren't familiar with that, what that is, is it, your camera takes multiple pictures, you know, in quick succession. Um, so if you, if your camera doesn't have it built in, uh, you have to do that manually. So you you move your camera physically closer to the subject, taking multiple pictures. Uh, because I have an Olympus, uh, I, it has it built in. So I can just put my camera on a tripod and uh, set it to focus stacking mode. And I can take 30, 60 pictures. And what you're doing is you're getting these really thin, like, uh, you know, the, the depth of field is like razor thin for some of these subjects. I mean, this was at maximum zoom. So you have this razor thin depth of field and it's just going along the subject little by little. And then later on you load it into Photoshop, uh, which is how I do it. I actually tried multiple different softwares and so far Photoshop does the best job. Uh, and then you can get this picture. This was actually a cellar spider. Uh, they're not that interesting other than that they're worldwide and they, they live in houses. And they're quite common, but they have really cool faces once you get up close. So I found one in my house. This was during quarantine, so I had nothing else to do. And I put it on my desk and I was, I was taking pictures of it. And then it was like running around and being really annoying. And then all of a sudden it went under my table and kind of hung there. And then it was finally still. So then you can see on the right here, I got my tripod. I mean, this was at maximum zoom with my Rainox and everything. So, I mean, I, I had to get like even I, I had to like actually turn it so that it, it waited a second or two after pressing the shutter button to start taking the focus stack because it, it was like the, the blur was too much. Uh, the motion, you know, it, it was it's a very tricky shot to get. And you can see that like to get the actual picture, I had to put my flash, take it off and put the remote shutter on and put it behind. So this is a stack of about 30 images. 
And another really cool thing that happened by accident was that uh, my black IKEA table, uh, for some reason, cast this really cool like blue effect over the over the the background. So it was like this really unintended but very awesome like effect that I got in this picture. So yeah, I'm really stoked for that. And I love uh, the, how the legs are kind of like disappearing into the background. So I have a lot of more a lot more focus stacking to show you. In fact, here's another one. Um, this so this was also during quarantines. Um, you know not that amazing to look at, but uh, this spider is absolutely, I mean, it's less than a millimeter. It's absolutely tiny. And this is a focus stack of about 30, 30 or 40 images. And now the naturalist in me is gonna take over. And so this is a goblin spider. So, I mean, this is just some spider crawling over my table. I capture it, I took pictures of it, and then uh, I, I managed to ID it off, off the internet. But then I found out it's actually a goblin spider. So these things actually come from West Africa. And what makes them special, apart from the fact they have six eyes, and they have, if you look on its abdomen here, they have a, have a hard carapace that's really unusual for spiders. Uh, there's one other example I have in my presentation I'll show you later, and that's also very interesting. But that's very unusual for spiders. And what also makes them interesting is that they are uh, parthenogenic, which means that they can breed without males. And because of that one thing, they've spread pretty much everywhere humans have gone around the world. And you can find them all over the world. And even on the, the Cook Islands, uh, they've been found there. So just by taking this picture of a spider walking across my, my desk, I tapped into this amazing story of these uh, spiders traveling all over the world and this uh, incredible species that's parthenogenic and uh, traveling everywhere. And this is, this is the excitement of, of, of nature photography for me. It's like, you, you kind of don't really know what you're taking a picture of. And then you find out these amazing stories uh, later on down the line. So a uh, really interesting thing I found there. Uh, but yeah, this is also a tiny spider, less than a millimeter, and it's focus stacked, uh, so maybe 30 images. Uh, another focus stacked image, and some, something I really like taking is uh, spider portraits. These are really popular on a lot of uh, macro photography groups. One thing I learned really early on, at least with nature photography, probably with other styles as well, is that the best pictures are always taken from the subject's level. You know, you don't it's easy to take a picture from the top down and sometimes that is a good picture to take but really the ones that everyone enjoys looking at are the ones where you're you're on eye level with your subject that was the first thing i learned from underwater macro but obviously in macro photography that 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 can be a serious challenge uh so for this image uh this was actually out in um uh, on a night safari with steven and uh this is heteropoda boy uh it's one of the few uh, heteropoda sp spiders that have actually been named. A lot of them are just not even ID'd, ID'd at all. Uh, but it's a really cool looking spider and they change their color to match whatever trees they live on and they're, they're beautiful spiders. Uh, so it was just hanging out and I just put my camera like right in front of it and very carefully man maneuvered myself into place and turned focus stacking on and took a series of 30 images uh, one after the other. And then of course I got this image. So um, yeah, nice uh, spider portrait. So. As I mentioned earlier, um, I tend to upload my, my pictures on Instagram. And so I think it's worth talking about uh, what an interesting experience it is for photographers nowadays to like be able to have communities or to kind of load your pictures up. And so my the way I display my pictures is that I'll have like a key image at the start. I'll add more pictures for context and scale uh, if I have them. And then um, in the description, I'll also add, um, you know, a lot of like any nat any naturalist facts that I've found uh, about the the species, so I, and I always tend to find a lot of information about them. But one of the great things about uh, Instagram is I can you know consult with this uh, huge community of other macro photographers, and I can see what they're looking at, and I can see what other people are interested in, and it even gives me an insight into which pictures are doing well. So it kind of gives me some feedback from the community about um, kind of what what pictures are are considered good, or which ones I like versus which ones do well. And I think that's that's a really interesting um, you know, thing for photographers. And it's really only been around the last 10 years or so. I also have a philosophy that if you're not sharing your pictures, then what's the point? You know, so uh, that's kind of the way I approach photography. So speaking of Instagram, um, this is my probably my most viral image. If 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 I can ever, if I can claim to have any images that went viral. Uh, this is a an Opatometa sarawakensis uh, spider. They're they're really uh, they're quite large. They have this one has like a really distinct red and blue abdomen, and then you can see Opatometta species have uh, these these hairs along their uh, hind legs, 
and that I found a paper and they're, they're apparently referred to as hearing hairs. So it's a very interesting spider. And this species was actually only discovered as recently as 2016. So it's a relatively new species. Uh, but this, this picture, and, and oh, another interesting thing about this picture is that uh, I took it with this big diffuser and it didn't really work. And in fact, when I looked at my camera, uh, the image was completely black. So it was only later in, in, in post-processing that I turned the exposure all the way up, had to turn the noise reduction all the way to the, to the max. And then I got this image and it was like my most popular image on Instagram. So, you know, my theoretical best picture ever was completely black in my camera and, you know, something that most people would probably just delete uh, immediately from their camera. So don't delete your cameras in the field. That's my advice. Don't, you know, not, it's never, it's not, not a bad picture until it's a bad picture. But this picture went, went pretty viral. Like I, it was, I put it on, on Facebook groups and I mean, he had like hundreds of, of other people like sharing it to other different platforms. There was like an Israeli spider appreciation society that like uh, shared it to their group. And like, I got messages from like, like arachnid fans, like all over the place and they were going nuts. And then like all these other macro groups were sharing on their platform. So uh, yeah, this, this image has always been kind of interesting to me, but um, yeah, and the subject as well is very cool. Another interesting thing about online communities in the kind of and macro photography in the 21st century is that uh, there's websites like iNaturalist. So a lot of the times, and maybe this is kind of unique to nature photography, probably macro, is that a lot of the times I'm taking pictures of things and I have no idea what they are yet. You know, I, it's really only later on that um, I upload these pictures to iNaturalist and then I get people from other areas and communities to help me identify which species they are. And it's been a really interesting experience for me. Like, um, you know, I found out there's like spider people and there's like snake people. And, you know, there's like beetle guys. There's like guys who are seriously into beetles. Like every time I upload a beetle picture, there's like, it's the same people and they, they immediately know what species it is. And uh, there's like three spider guys. One of them lives in Jakarta and he's, uh, he's been IDing like everything I upload on there. I love it. And um, it's really interesting to be able to like, uh, not only upload my pictures and get uh, a specific species, which is really important to me, uh, but I'm actually helping with kind of, you know, biology studies because a lot of this goes into research. So, you know, people uploading pictures and identifying species is actually increasing the knowledge we have of the biodiversity of Malaysia as a whole. And uh, it's been a really great experience. Um, I even have a picture later that I'll show you that um, I actually now, I'm now in touch with wasp experts and they helped to identify a couple of species there. Uh, some of which were not known to be in Malaysia, as far as I, I was aware. So it was really interesting that the right people are finding out the right information that, uh, you know, super difficult for them to find out otherwise. I mean, sending biologists out to do field work is, seems to be almost impossible. Uh, to give you an example, um, there's a species of spider called uh, Hamadruas. So there's like Hamadruas hierographica, Hamadruas cerebrocensis, or I don't even know. But like, there's only like one paper on that entire genus, you know, and all of that came from, you know, biologists coming out here doing a study and they gasped like one tree and just collected whatever fell out of it. So there's really not a lot of money and, and time that goes into this. So uploading your pictures and contributing to that research is a really good thing to do, in my opinion. So there's a there's a strong uh, you know, ecological standpoint to uh, what, what I'm doing here. So now we're going to move back to the cool pictures again. OK, so this is. Uh, just I'm just showing you some some interesting images because uh, some of them there's a lot more that goes on in the background that uh, maybe you don't see. So this was from a safari I did with Stephen uh, up in the um, the Fraser Hills, and this is uh, obviously a rhino beetle, and it's really big. It was big enough that we could actually get the diffuser out. You can see here on the right, uh, we could get the big soft box out and then put the remote trigger on, and then start taking pictures. And the way I got this uh, image here on the left was by doing focus stacking with the flash in the softbox focused on the beetle. Uh, so you get this, it, you know, it's so shiny. I mean, you can see there's like reflections of plenty already. So, I mean, it's so shiny that even with a softbox, you're getting like a lot of reflection. You can actually see the, the, the softbox in its eyes down there in, this, in the, the lower corner. But by doing focus stacking, um, I can get the full kind of depth of the beetle but I can keep that soft, super bokehed out background that I get from that wide uh, aperture. So that's one of the advantages of you. And by the way, the background is natural light. 
So this is actually a combined flash and natural light uh, photograph. And when I uploaded it to Instagram, I had one of my macro friends who, who you know, is also really into this stuff. He, he commented, he's like, normal people will have no idea how hard a shot like this is. And, you know, the, just the fact that the beetle is willing to cooperate and stand there complete. And by the way, when you're focus stacking, your subject cannot move at all. So you really, you kind of get a sense of when it's still, it's going to be still and when it's going to stay, you know, when, it, when it's going to start moving again. And you really have to kind of become one with your subject and understand how it's going to work. Um, so more pictures from, and by the way, all of these pictures are now going to be really scattered and, you know, it's going to seem like there's, it's just me going, oh yeah, let's put that picture in there. So I, I apologize if this seems disjointed from here on out. So I'm <laughs> just going to start showing you more pictures here. So this is another really cool subject, and this is also from Bukit Fraser. Uh, so this is a uh, Lethistid uh, Malayan, Malayanus. I'm, I'm having a really hard time remembering the Latin names after so long in, in my uh, in lockdowns. But um, this is a trapdoor spider, and this only this species only lives in Bukit uh, Fraser, and it's a really interesting species. And trapdoor spiders themselves are actually an extremely primitive form of spider. If you look on its abdomen here, you can actually see, and I apologize if this is freaking anyone out, but if you look on, on trapdoor spiders' abdomens, they have these plates. So this is actually analogous to the, if you think about this, the tail on a scorpion, it has those plates moving up, up its tail. So um, trapdoor spiders are actually like a remnant of the common ancestor between scorpions and spiders when they split off, because they're both arachnids. So like I took this picture and I kind of read up on it and I, I was wondering like what those plates are. And so this is actually like a living fossil. I mean, it's, it, this is functionally unchanged from the fossils we found of these spiders uh, dating back to like the Cretaceous and before. So an incredibly ancient species. And uh, they're, they're really uh, fascinating. And they, they only live in Bukit Fraser. And uh, unfortunately they're also, um, you know, like considered threat, a threatened species. So. Um, it's really unfortunate that a lot of people are scared of spiders or just insects in general, because uh, Malaysia actually has an incredible wealth of biodiversity in the form of insects, and no one's really looking after them. I mean, no one's really doing a lot of effort in conserving this part of Malaysia's national heritage. So part of what I'm hoping to do is maybe kind of raise awareness that these things are amazing and that they exist, and maybe they're worth uh, looking after. And maybe the more Malaysians I can convince that they have an amazing, uh, you know, natural history, and um, the more the more I can help uh, the biodiversity of this country, maybe that's my small contribution. So I have more spiders to show you. Hold on right there, because there's also uh, a subset of, of spiders called uh, spiny orb weavers, and some of these are absolutely remarkable. Um, so this is I'm going to refer to them like as an umbrella term. I'm just going to call them the gastrocanthus spiders. So but they, they seem to be, for, for reasons known only to biologists, they're, they're grouped into different genuses for some reason. But to me, they're all just kind of spiny orb weavers. And they're, they, they're all based in Malaysia. And they, they are they're around the world, but these species specifically are only found in Malaysia and kind of uh, Borneo and those kinds of areas. And they're absolutely amazing. So here we have Macrocantha arcuata, which has these absolutely um, incredible spikes uh, on, its, on its sides. And this spider I actually saw when I was just getting into macro photography, I was like, I saw pictures of it. I was like, this is amazing. This is the one spider I, I think of all the things I want to photograph, this is it. And I saw it like two weeks after I got my, my, my mirrorless camera. So unfortunately I haven't seen it since. And so I've only got like this kind of barely passable by my now, my standards now image, but um, absolutely amazing spider. One of the theories about the horns uh, is that it stops birds from eating it. So it seems to be like a camouflage. So it kind of breaks up the shape of the spider and it stops birds from eating it. Um, so while looking at this spider and looking into like, okay, well, what other spiny orb weavers are there? Because these are amazing. Uh, I came across another species called Actinacantha globulata, which I just thought was the most insane looking spider I'd ever seen. And I thought it was incredible, but it was only in Sarawak. So I thought, well, I'm never going to see it because I'm only ever going to be over there like once or twice. So uh, last year I ended up going there uh, for a work trip and I took the weekend off and I, I just went on a hike uh, with a guide in, into the mountains. And uh, by complete and utter chance, I stumbled over one. So here is Actinacantha globulata. And uh, as you can see, like it's got this incredible, um, 
you know, body shape. And again, these spikes seem to be a uh, defense against birds and other predators of it. So um, I managed to get one passable shot that all the others were, were terrible by my standards now. Uh, but this, this spider was just absolutely incredible. And I stumbled over it by complete accident. And I don't know what it's like for other, other photographers, maybe with street photographers, there's, you know, it's that wonderful, happy accident that you get. But for me, this is like, this is just like Pokemon. You know, it's like you find like these rare holographic Pokemon and then you get really excited you get a picture and then it's like your whole day is made. I think I was riding this wave for weeks after this. I was so happy. And the fact that I just picked a hiking experience on Airbnb and I, I found this spider, I wasn't even looking for spiders, just blew my mind uh, and I'll probably never see it again, but really amazing spider. And uh, it's astonishing that these things are actually alive in, 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 uh, in Malaysia. Just looking at some more of these spiny orb weavers, this is Gastrocantha cooley. This is the black and white spiny orb weaver. Uh, I think what makes these interesting is that, I don't know if this is a thing with other people in photography, but anything that's white in macro is like immediately blows out. Like, I mean, anything white, like I have to set my camera on my, or my flash on like half power that I normally use. And then I just so delicately have to photograph it because anything white just completely blows out. Uh, the, the picture. So these things are really hard to get. And I think this is actually a focus stack of uh, three images that I just took going in manually. So, um, you know, Photoshop is pretty powerful at being able to fix my mistakes. Just to show you some more amazing uh, spiny orb weavers, this is Gaster, Gastrocantha diardi. Uh, and this one is actually in um, Bukit Fraser. So it has this amazing body shape and spines on its sides. Uh, again, a defense from birds. But the other interesting thing about this spider is that it glows in the dark under UV light. So here on the left, you can see uh, what the spider looks like under UV light. Uh, you can buy like UV torches on uh, Lazada. And here on the right, you can see under normal light. And Stephen, you'll remember this was a really tricky image to get. I mean, so the way I got it was that um, we had our camera. Well, we, we both got this shot basically, but I had my camera on, on a tripod. Uh, and I set it as still as I could. I took a normal shot with a flash on, and then uh, I removed the flash and I uh, fiddle with the settings. I think the shutter speed was down to like like 11 seconds. So then we turn off all the lights in the room and then um, we get the UV flash flashlight and we moved moved it over in complete pitch blackness. We, we turn the camera on, we move the UV flashlight through a diffusing material like uh, packing foam. So you'd move it through and it, it turns the UV light into this really diffused soft light. Um, so, I mean, just a really tricky shot, but I really loved being able to get the normal light and the uh, UV uh, glow in the dark shot in the, with the same pose. And by the way, the spider wasn't always cooperating. So anytime, as soon as it moved, like we would have to start all over again. So you can imagine for 11 seconds, you're just holding your breath. I mean, and you're just, moving the UV light to try and get as diffuse a light as you can, but the effect is amazing. Um, so Roy, uh, hmm, yeah, question. Please. So when you took this, you knew that it's one of, it, it had this characteristic, right? Yeah, yeah, there, there's other people, Nikki Bay, uh, probably one of the most famous macro photographers in Southeast Asia, uh, had a picture showing this effect. Uh, so I knew about it beforehand, you know, I, in my spare time, I probably browse macro, photo macro photography and other forms but I knew that it had this and the other ones don't. The other interesting thing, or at least as far as I know, the other spiny orb weavers don't have this. So for some reason, this spider has evolved this, this ability. And there's a couple of theories and I've, I've talked to the spider geeks on iNaturalist and I've asked for their opinions. Um, and by the way, I was the first one to photo photograph this on iNaturalist. So now they had proof that it did this on, on that website anyway. Um, so one theory is that birds can see in UV light. So this maybe like is a warning to birds not to eat it, but birds eat spiders. So you'd think that it wouldn't want to show itself to them. Um, the other theory is that um, maybe this is like a, a protection against UV light because maybe these things are in Bukit Fraser. They're exposed to more UV uh, rays than other spiders. Um, and in the same way that coral fluoresces under UV light because it's, it's a, because it's a, a natural sunblock that they have it, it reflects uv light maybe this is a similar sort of thing so that's the two theories they have but of course no one really knows and maybe the spiders just did it because they thought it was cool but either way makes for a great picture and uh i was really really stoked with this 
and oh, and the, obviously here's my, my, my amazing, my beautiful, my thumb modeling to give you a sense of scale. And uh, I think it's always just important to bring people back down to like, no, 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 these things are tiny, you know. Nicely so, manicured thumb. <laughs> say what, sorry? Nicely manicured thumb. Oh, right yeah, I, yeah, I know. I always, I always see these pictures and I'm like, ooh, I need to moisturize. <laughs> you need to start moisturizing at night or something. Yes, perfectly curved. So again, here, here's another interesting um, focus stacked image. And I'll, the next slide will show you what each individual image looks like. So you can see how thin that, that, that uh, focus uh, frame of uh, plane of focus. Thank you. That plane of focus is uh, for a lot of this because, you know, it's, it's really um, tricky to get it right. But this is like maximum zoom on a longhorn beetle. And I love their faces. They look so cool. And Stephen, you'll remember it was like, it stood, it was like, just going all over the place and then it finally sat down it was still for like like five minutes and I, like so i just set my camera up on a tripod and just did focus stack after focus stack and i just moved my camera around back and forth just a tiny hair to make sure i had all those individual uh, parts of the beetle and then of course i got home and i, I think photoshop it sounded like my computer was going to explode because like i think it was like it was so image intensive I, there was like 60 images that went into this one picture and uh, Photoshop was just screaming. It was it was un under such a load. Uh, but you can see here is an example of what each of those pictures look like. So you can see that the depth of field for uh, whatever aperture I'm on is like really thin, but it gives you that really high detail. So uh, that was a really difficult image to get. And I love longhorn beetle. So here's another image of a longhorn beetle uh, that was an a, you know focus stack. And uh, this was an extremely patient beetle. It just kind of stood there for, for, I mean, probably like half an hour, didn't move at all. So I got some really good pictures of that. And I love the way that, um, you know, you can see that like, not only are you getting the full depth of field, but because you're stacking each image, it seems to like increase the resolution of it or something. You know, it's almost like you're kind of like decreasing the noise by additive uh, pictures. Another really good thing for focus stacked uh, images is that the smaller the subject is, uh, the thinner, the, the more magnified you go, the thinner the depth of uh, field you you get, even on a wide, on a short aperture or wide aperture. So this is another focus stacked image of um, uh, cordyceps. This is actually, oh, actually it's Ophiocordyceps fungus. So this is a parasitic fungus that affects uh, ants and then uh, takes over their bodies and turns them into zombies. It even has like mind control and everything. Um, it's a really fascinating organism because most fungus is fairly straightforward and simple as far as, you know, I was always led to believe I me. Mean, they kind of make mushrooms, they absorb nutrients, and then randomly out of nowhere, you get like this one species that learns how to like, you know, not only infect an, uh, an, arthro you know, an arthropod, but like dig into its brain and like turn it into a zombie and then get it to crawl up a tree so it can spread its spores over the rest of the ant nest. So uh, really amazing organisms. And this is the first time I've, I, I'd come across um, like such a good specimen of the uh, Ophiocordyceps uh, fruiting body. So you can see here the ant. Um, one of the interesting things is that the last thing it does before it dies is that it bites down on the leaf. And all of this is done by the fungus emitting neurotoxins. So you can see the death grip onto that leaf there uh, is, is latching it onto the, to the leaf to spread spores over the rest of the forest. And we actually have fossil records of leaves where we can identify those bite marks. So we know how, how far back the Ophiocordyceps fungus goes because we know what that, uh, that looks like. Another parasitic uh, fungus um, is the kind of, I think it's called the insect destroyer. The Latin name is, I don't even, I'm not even gonna try pronouncing it. You know, one of the fun things about uh, learning about biology is that I can spell a lot of words, but I can't pronounce them. So I know what I'm talking about and I can text it to you, but God help me if I'm giving a talk and I try to pronounce it, I'm sure I would get it wrong completely. But again, you can see that um, this insect is kind of glued to this branch by the fungus, which has taken over the brain of, of the insect. And uh, also the last thing it told the insect to do uh, was to open its wings so that the fruiting body can, can be uh, emitted from the uh, insect's body. Okay, that's the last, probably one of the last gross things you're gonna have to watch, but uh, scientifically very interesting. So now we're going to move back to my, my favorite subject, which is spiders and jumping spiders. And uh, I think these are just images to show you that, um, you know, the, the underwater macro photographer in me was starting to feel experimental. And 
there was like a phase online where people were getting um, black plastic perspex, like uh, like very reflective uh, pieces of plastic and just putting the subject on them and taking pictures. So you can see that you get this really uh, interesting mirror effect. So it gives you a very abstract uh, picture. And you can see here uh, again, you get this like cool abstract picture. So I love, again, I love experimenting with macro photography and getting new effects and coming up with new ideas. Uh, so this is obviously just a Theania bamoensis uh, fighting spider, but other jumping spiders are also very interesting too. Uh, this is a uh, Myrmorachne cornuta. This is an ant mimic jumping spider. So you remember at the beginning of the, the presentation, there was a uh, praying mantis that uh, or mer uh, did uh, ant mimicking. Mer eh, I've already forgotten the word. So this is also another insect that is mimicking an ant. Uh, and so the males of this species, I have a picture of a female in a second, but like the males of this species have extremely elongated uh, chelicerae. So that's their fangs. Their fangs are really long and that actually mimics not only an ant, but it mimics an ant carrying another ant. So the males of this species grow these really long fangs. And I also found out they use them to, to battle with each other. So in this next picture, uh, oh, actually yeah, this picture here, you can see that their fangs are like folded in and they're extremely long, but they actually like defend their territory against other males by batting them against uh, each other. And they're, they're, they have very complex uh, social lives, very interesting spider. But I think it's also worth looking at the body shape and just how far this ant, this, this spider has gone to look like an ant. Um, I'm absolutely obsessed with these guys. I, I love them. And there's, there's uh, several species in Malaysia and all of them are, are really fascinating. And here's a picture of a female from a different species, but you can see that the uh, fangs uh, are short and uh, short, short and stubby and just uh, looks like a general normal spider. I really like these, uh, you're, you're probably gonna notice this a lot, but I really like these kind of like portraits of spiders. And I really like looking at the, the face and getting these, this symmetrical com uh, composition of a lot of insects here. So those, this other, these species are, uh, Murmurachne genus spiders. And so they, they're kind of associated with jumping spiders, which are Salticidae. Uh, and I hope I'm not getting my biology terms wrong. I'm, I'm only an amateur. Um, but it turns out there's actually another spider type of spider, um, the crab spiders. They've also, some of them have evolved to look like ants as well. So you have something called convergent evolution where these spiders have found it uh, beneficial to uh, mimic ants. And that is uh, Amicia fordyceps. And this spider, uh, this is actually my most recent picture. Uh, I found it just uh, down by the road one day. I was very surprised. And these spiders are absolutely amazing. Uh, first of all, I, they have googly eyes. How many, how many times are you gonna be able to find a spider with cool googly eyes? And they also have an amazing display where they, you can see that they're sticking their, their front legs up and they signal to each other with a little dance uh, going up and down like that. Uh, they're really uh, fascinating and they're really fun to watch. Like they're, they're very expressive with their, their with their legs, and they do this little dance. Absolutely amazing! Love the way they look. You can see zooming in as well. Like, uh, got some great detail on uh, on its face. And again, I think the 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 MK diffuser just gives an amazing light for a lot of my subjects. Just again to show you the body shape um, on its abdomen, you can actually see some false eyes. So this spider is not only um, mimicked an ant; it's actually mimicked its eyes on its on its abdomen. And to try to increase the effect of that. And it actually, these, these uh, spiders specifically prey on uh, har or weaver ants, I, I think. So they, they also have that color and they look a lot like them. So they're doing everything they can to mimic those weaver ants. Really remarkable. This is another really interesting image. Uh, it's kind of two in one. So the first thing is that um, we're looking at a spitting spider that's carrying an egg sac. And that egg sac has been parasitized by Idris wasps. So the first thing that's really interesting is that spitting spiders are really cool. They're, they've evolved um, to not uh, spin, not exactly, they, they can still spin silk from their abdomens, but they've actually evolved to spit goo from um, their uh, fangs instead of venom. So they're, when they see prey, they actually spit um, like a kind of very sticky viscous material that traps their prey onto the leaf or whatever substrate they're on. And then they, and they can go in and eat them. So they're, they're, that's why they're called spitting spiders. Really fascinating. And then these wasps, when I, when I zoomed in, it's, first of all, it's carrying their, its egg sac. And you can actually see some of the 
um, spiders inside have already, uh, you know, hatched from their eggs. But these uh, wasps on, on the outside are interest wasps, and they're parasites, uh, usually of stink bugs. But a couple of species um, actually go after spiders. And so when I uploaded this, I got some wasps ex experts to come and like help me ID them. And um, it's the only sighting that I'm aware of in like Southeast Asia. I think there's only one or two other sightings of this. So now uh, these amazing uh, creatures are, you know, some researcher out there is probably going to be able to know that, oh, okay, these actually exist here. Uh, they're actually really useful for uh, parasite control in farming because, you know, if you're trying to get rid of parasites, the only alternative you really have to, um, you know, just letting them go is like you have to spray, you know, chemicals and pesticides everywhere, which really screws up with biodiversity. But uh, interest wasps are interesting because they're being studied for being able to um, go after like parasites of, of crops. And, um, you know, it's a natural way of uh, defending uh, food against pests. And uh, because they, you know, they only go after a specific insect and then they die. So these wasps are, are, are really amazing. They also have a fascinating life cycle. Like when they hatch, the males will immediately impregnate the females and then die. And then the females will go off in search of another spider. And somehow they can sense a pheromone in the web that these spiders lay specifically for egg sacs. So there's something going on in this forest where these wasps are incredibly attuned to this one chemical that's probably one of millions going around in the forest and they can find that one spider that's just uh, laid a sack of eggs and then go and uh, parasitize it. Really amazing organism. Other parasitic wasps are uh, this wasp, for instance, the anastatus wasp. Uh, this, I just kind of stumbled over it. It's a parasite of stink bug eggs. Um, so I've actually started kind of keeping an eye out for small wasps that I find walking around. Um, so it goes after stink bugs. And as you can see, it's absolutely minuscule in size. Uh, that's my, my thumb on the side there. And then sometimes I take pictures of wasps, uh, parasitic wasps by accident. So I was actually looking at this um, gathering of uh, bark lice and I, I couldn't, couldn't figure out what they were. So I was just taking pictures and it was only later that I found this picture, found the wasp. And then I have another picture where it's actually uh, attacking one of the other uh, insects, uh, trying to parasitize it apparently. So uh, lots of interesting things can happen when, with, with parasitic wasps in the forest. And they seem to be a really um, uh, active member of the, the rainforest in terms of the macro world anyway. Another thing that was surprising, um, sometimes, you know, talking about surprises. So you, you kind of point your camera at things, you take a picture, and it's only later that you really realize what, what's going on. Um, I, on one of my many night safaris with Stephen, um, I found a harvestman spider. So these are order opilionis, and they're, they're also an arachnid, but they're a different order. So you have like spiders, you have tarantula or scorpions, megalomorphs, all these other things. And these are opilionis. They're extremely ancient organism. And they date all the way back to the Silurian. Fun fact, one of the first things we ever found in the fossil record that had a penis was a harvestman spider. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fun fact for you to tell the boys at the pub next time you're out. Uh, so I, I, one, you know, I saw this and I wasn't that interested, but then I zoomed in and then I got um, one of these shots where uh, actually they look incredible up close. And uh, since that point, I got really interested in harvestmen. And uh, it turns out there, there's some fascinating uh, harvestmen out there. In fact, I found another one not too long after that. This is a Sandokan genus one and um, equally amazing. And they're, they're really cool looking uh, bugs. So now Stephen, we're finally gonna move on to snakes. You can, you can finally breathe a sigh of relief. And um, so uh, snakes are also another, another I, I like all of nature. It's not just spiders and insects. So I, I love doing all, all kinds of nature photography. Uh, probably one day I'll learn about plants and maybe when I finally run out of spiders to photograph, I'll get into birds and I'll be one of those guys. But uh, for the time <laughs> being, uh, it hasn't happened yet, and I'm still looking at snakes. So this is a, hang on, black tooth cat snake. Stephen, can you correct me? If, uh, black headed, headed cat snake. Black headed cat snake. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, boy guy yeah. degreeseps. Thank you. You're, there's gonna be a few more, so if you can just hang on right there. Um, so yeah, snakes. Boys, yeah. Snakes come out beautifully in uh, with the softbox. So just imagine. I, I don't think I put a picture in yet, and unfortunately didn't have an action shot of us taking a picture of it. But yeah, you usually get one of the other guys. One of the other guys on your team uh, to hold the soft box for you and then you take your picture and uh, it gives an amazing light you know if you, if you try and use like a just bare flash it's just really shiny you get a lot of hot spots so it's uh, you really need that soft box to get these kinds of pictures and the interesting thing about this was that i took one picture manually 
uh, and the, it was too far forward and the eyes weren't in focus, but the tongue was out. So I got the tongue in focus. And then the next picture had the eyes in focus. So then I just, and it was all like perfectly lined up. So I just loaded this into Photoshop, did a focus stack. And then I ended up with this image, which seemed to be even like when you zoom in, it was actually like a lot less noisy than even normally it would be. So I was really stoked with this image when I got home, really happy with it. This is a uh, oriental vine, a speckled oriental vine snake. I have Tula Prasina, if I'm remembering correctly. And uh, this is another, I was really stoked with this image because, uh, you know, with nature, you can't ask the subject to uh, look at you and smile or something. You know, it's, it's just doing its own thing and it's moving around. It's sometimes they're very patient, they're being uncooperative. And sometimes uh, you just, the stars align. And here, you know, the snake just kind of, the pictures before this is like the snake's looking one way and the picture after this is looking another and it just had like right in the middle and I got the eyes in focus and I was really uh, stoked with this image and I think one of my friends saw this on Instagram and you can see like, it's kind of like it's got it's almost looks like it's got its eyebrow cocked and he's like that's what it, that's what that's what I look like when my girlfriend steals my last slice of pizza you know <laughs> so you know um, like, yeah, some great great uh, uh Sorry, right. Uh, yeah. Just to add to this particular picture, uh, yeah. this is a speckled vine snake, uh, okay. Petula. Oh gosh, the name is Fasciolata. Uh, and this one is very unusual because it has a color mutation. Normally, they are light brown in color with speckles all over them, but this one looked almost whitish green. And yeah, it was very, very unusual. And uh, my photo of the same snake, uh, there was a lot of buzz by the snake people around it. They were like, arguing with each other over what it was and stuff. <laughs> yeah, actually, on, on that note, one of the things that's been interesting about iNaturalist is that I thought to my, I bought a book on snakes and I was like, oh, cool. I can go on and help them, help other people ID some of the snakes, you know, contribute to the community. And you look at people's IDs on iNaturalist for snakes. And I mean, they're just arguing, like they're, they're like fighting over like exactly what type of snake it is. And I mean, they're, they're, they're just a whole community unto themselves. You, you guys are weird. Uh, at the time, I thought this was a really cool snake. I, but, and I could tell Stephen was really excited. But yeah, I was very, uh, really happy with this picture. It came out great. And then uh, this is a Waggler's Pit Viper that I took when I went to, uh, again, it was like the last trip I took before the lockdown. Uh, I ran over to Sumatra and to like look at orangutans. And uh, along the way, uh, the guide said, oh, there's a really chill pit viper we can go and hang out with. So absolutely, the snake is uh, dangerous and, you know, took all the normal precautions you would take. Uh, but it was very chill. And there was this one moment where it just kind of looked at me and, uh, you know, was was hanging still. So again, we got that soft box out and uh, got uh, this this image of it. So, uh, and this is an adult female waggler's pit viper, Stephen, is that right? Like, yep, absolutely yeah, correct. Okay, good. Yeah, and so the, the coloring on this is... is you really have to see these things in real life because honestly, like pit vipers just have like the most vibrant color of, I've, I've seen on anything. I mean, they're they're absolutely stunning in real life. I hope everyone gets to see one at least once and in a controlled way. Uh, if you want to see pit vipers and a lot of other animals, Stephen does night safaris when all these lockdowns are over. Uh, I can't recommend it enough, even if you're not a photographer or anything. Uh, highly, highly recommended. Um, so yeah, this this uh, this pit. Actually, another interesting thing about these these pit vipers is that they have multiple colorations over their lifetime. So the juveniles are like green, and they have like uh, different colorations, and then they they turn into like teenager snakes, and they have like a different coloration for that phase. So like now, not only do I have to get this subject, I have to get it on all the different phases of its life to get the full you know Pokemon set. I guess you know. So I, I have to, all the Pokemon. I, I have to ask this question. Sure. Is, is this snake particularly dangerous? I believe so. Stephen, do you want to comment? Like, um, how, the hell do you like take a snake that close, <laughs> knowing that it's dangerous? Eh? I always, I always have a guide. If I, I, I would, ne I, for me personally, I never handle dangerous snakes in general. In general, in general, I up until now I've been pretty good. Um, and I, I obviously don't. I want to disturb the wildlife as little as possible. So I always have an experienced safari guide with me, uh, especially if I'm out in an environment where I'm going to run into. Uh, pit vipers, for instance. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'll take this question. Um, oh, yeah. Pit vipers are one of the more cooperative snakes to photograph because they ambush predators. They just sit still and wait for their predators to uh, wait for their prey to come to them. 
So sometimes if you're lucky, you'll be able to find a pit viper in the perfect position. You can move in with your lights and you don't have to do much to disturb the snake. Uh, but uh, yeah, sometimes because they're covered with foliage and we want to get a nice photo, we uh, will use a hook to move it to a stick and we'll just place it on the stick. And these guys are extremely cooperative. They just sit there and look at you angrily. <laughs> and they, uh, they wouldn't strike at you un unless you get very, very, very close, which is about one third of your body length. That's your striking range. But to uh, take a shot, you are what, literally six inches from this? No, oh. I think it's further. So yeah, the, I'm trying to think now. So this is on. I have my my camera on a remote trigger. Yeah. Uh, the guide is like holding my my softbox and managing you know the other things, and I'm so I'm kind of with a remote trigger. I think I'm about that far away, so not within striking distance. And um, you know, it, it's I definitely take precautions, and the camera's always between me and and the the snake. And uh, it's definitely I'm definitely not like within striking distance of it as far as, and I do take precautions. But you know, uh, I do, I always try to be as safe as possible. And, uh, it's usually pretty rare. Yeah. yeah. And then another thing I would like to add is that um, amongst the pit vipers, the waggler's pit viper is the least venomous. Uh, I've heard many cases of people bitten by these and it is painful, but after just resting for a day, they're entirely fine the next day. Uh, that said, I would not recommend anyone handling these just with their bare hands or at all if, uh, if you've got no good reason to. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, do take all the precautions. Uh, if you're not confident with your snake handling abilities, then don't do it. It's not worth the photo. Oh, um, no, definitely not. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you can just enjoy it by looking at it. So, you know, it's, it's exactly. not necessary to handle things. Yeah, um, yeah. The other, the one, there's one other thing about this picture before, before Steven gets in. Uh, you know, in, my, in the course of my job, I have to talk to clients a lot and I give a lot of presentations. And sometimes those presentations can be quite tricky and we have to negotiate certain things or we have to like discuss a difficult problem and get how, how we're going to get past it. And so uh, I tend to put this as my desktop background uh, whenever I have a difficult client. And then uh, so when, when it blows up on <laughs> when, when my computer gets connected to the main monitor and it, like the image, it's like, oh, you know, it kind of gives me a, I feel like it gives me a little bit of an edge whenever I'm giving tricky presentations. So just a little trick for you guys. If you ever have like you know, tricky clients, you know, you can just borrow one of my pictures and use it as your desktop background so that it's like, oh, accidental, accidentally spooked your client. Anyway, yeah, sorry, what were you going to say, Stephen? I think I'm going to pick you up on the offer. I might, I don't <laughs> think my wife likes snakes, so do send me some of your more scary photos. Please. Okay, all right, deal, <laughs> deal. Yeah. Um, I got nothing much to add other than, yeah, Waggler's Pit Vipers, uh, one of the least venomous uh, pit vipers amongst the 20-ish species of pit vipers we have in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Uh, the others are very deadly venomous, so yeah, not a joke. Yeah, uh, yeah. that's all. Back to you, Roy. Yep. Okay. <laughs> and I think this is the last uh, snake picture I've got. Uh, this is a dog tooth cat snake, and I, we, were, we were really stoked to see this on our our latest our last safari before this last uh, lockdown. Uh, and so I have, uh, again, this is just using a softbox. In fact, you can see the reflection in its eye. And then, of course, I, I kind of uh, said that I think this is F seven or F eight. And uh, so we're just kind of sometimes the black background can't be avoided, especially when you're, you're taking photographs at night. So this is generally how I would photograph snakes, um, like trying to get a good profile shot or a good uh, portrait of them. The other the joke I like to make about uh, animals is that um, if, if an animal has another animal's name in its name, uh, it's, it's really cool. And so if an animal has two other animals in its name, it's like the coolest one out of all of them. So this is a dog tooth cat snake. And so this is like extra, like triple points for, for macro, for a nature photographer, in my opinion. And I think um, if you, Stephen, can you comment like why it's a cat, dog tooth cat snake? Maybe that'd be interesting to know. Um, so supposedly they have uh, canine fangs. They have fangs uh, at the front of their mouth uh, that are conical in shape so it's supposed to look like a dog's tooth uh but we didn't snakes, check we didn't we did we not didn't. we did not <laughs> confirm that so you know like no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these snakes are mildly venomous they're not deadly venomous uh but the fang that injects the venom is near the back of their mouths there are what we call rear fang snakes uh, but they do have irregular teeth at the front that they're used for grasping on to prey that are not hollow that do not inject venom so i think uh the scientific community is referring to those teeth, the fixed teeth that are conical in shape. 
So yeah, that's where the dog to dog tooth part comes in. They're called cat mm -hmm. snakes because they have vertical pupils. Oh, so yeah. hence dog tooth cat snake. <laughs> Three animals in one. Okay, and I, I'm realizing I'm going on a long time. I don't know if everyone's appetite for nature photography is equal to mine, so I'll, I'm, I hope I'm not going on for too long. Let me know if I'm overrunning and I'll try to speed this up. Um, I thought this, this next image is interesting because it compares the, this is actually the second time I've seen that snake, and the, the first time I saw it was on the first ever night safari I ever did. So on the left, you can see my first attempts at nature photography on my first ever night safari. And then my most recent picture of a, of a dog tooth cat snake. So it was really fun to get that comparison of like, here is where I started and here's where I am now. So, you know, it's like confirmation I'm going in the right direction. Okay, moving on. So the next thing I'm gonna show you is uh, Porsche spiders. And they are without a doubt, one of the coolest things in macro, the macro world. Uh, so they are specialist jumping spiders and they hunt other spiders. Uh, that means that they um, have lots of different strategies for for attacking other spiders, and um, like like they'll they'll climb onto a branch that's above um, you know maybe like a normal uh, kind of garden spider, and they'll they'll lower themselves down Mission Impossible style, and then latch onto it and grab it. Uh, sometimes they'll climb onto the other spider's web, and they'll do it in a way that the other spider can't detect. So they're incredibly intelligent. They've shown the ability to to plan make plans for attacking the other spider in three dimensions. They can hold an idea in their head, absolutely remarkable. And as you can see, I found this subject, this is a Porsche uh, Labi Labiata, and it was in the middle of eating a Lukács Decorata. So um, it just kind of sat there munching away on this spider and it ate the whole thing. I mean, they're, they must be absolutely ravenous. In fact, on the left here, you can see it's, it's really fat, like the abdomen in the background is like, like huge and bulbous. So Porsche spiders are amazing and they, they live in South, Southeast Asia over to India. And in Malaysia, there's really three species. So this is uh, Porsche uh, labiata, if I'm remembering correctly. Yes, Porsche labiata. And then I also have photographed Porsche fimbriata. And there's only one other, one other identified species, which is Porsche crassipalpus. And it's really cool. It looks like it's got like these massive like pom-poms on, on, its, on its front face. It's a really amazing looking spider. And as you can see, uh, they're, they're like ridiculously well camouflaged. I mean, pretty much unless you see them moving or, or they're on another spider's web, I mean, it's impossible to see them. So I was really lucky. I found this one in the right, right on a leaf eating another spider. And then the Porsche Fimbriata, I was actually looking at something else and I saw a little speck of brown move. And out of the corner of my, my eye in the viewfinder, I kind of looked at it and I took a picture. And just to show you how well camouflaged they are, that's what it looked like against the tree. That it was on. I mean, just impossible to spot unless unless you just happen to be in the right place at the right time. But I was really thrilled with the picture I got here. And you can see this, this is a very distinctive pose of Porsche. They really like to have their front legs at like this weird angle. And they have this bizarre way of like moving in a clockwork way. So their head will stay still. And they just kind of like move around like this weird fashion. My friend told me she she's like, Roy, I can't wait to see your spider dances. So I, I don't know if she's on here, but uh, like this is this is the Porsche dance. So if you ever go to hit the clubs, like this is this is how you should do it. Uh, <laughs> uh, they're really uh, amazing. Go on YouTube and search for Porsche spiders. They're absolutely remarkable. And then there's a picture for scale, so you can see how tiny they are. Uh, this is the uh, another amazing. So the rest of this presentation is basically just amazing animals of Malaysia. And so this is the Wallace's flying tree frog. This is named after the naturalist uh, Sir Alfred Wallace, who kind of co-discovered the theory of evolution. And one of the ways he did that was he, he saw this frog uh, and, and its ability to glide through the forest. And he surmised that it must have, it didn't start, start off knowing how to glide through the forest. It must have gradually adapted to uh, having these big uh, uh, kind of fins to be able to glide through, uh, through the air. So he, he co-discovered the theory of evolution by seeing this frog. So, I mean, this is like a really iconic species of Malaysia. And uh, Stephen luckily knows a spot where we can hike all the way out to the rainforest to see these things. And so I, when I got my new uh, mirrorless camera, we, we went out with a softbox and got some, some really great images. Um, absolutely magnificent animal. In fact, I remember going on a website where they were talking about like my wish list for looking at snakes and amphibians. And actually this was like number two or number one of this like 
of this list. So, uh, you know, I feel extremely lucky to be able to see these, these creatures in real life. Uh, this is another amazing frog. Uh, this is the cinnamon frog. Uh, I can't remember the Latin name off the top of my head, but um, they, they're really remarkable and extremely relaxed and very easy to photograph. Stephen, do you remember the Latin name for this? Nictis alus pictus. That's the one. Thank you very much. <laughs> Steven, Steven's my like walking walking Wikipedia when we're out in the jungle because I, I never have a half, half an idea of some of these things. Um, this is another amazing species of uh, giraffe weevil. I've never actually been able to identify what specific species this is, but a uh, really remarkable insect. And they basically, the males have long necks that they use to fight over the other males. And the female will actually sit there and watch and like wait and kind of just see which weevil takes over and which one knocks the other one off. And then she'll mate with the winner. If you ever go to a tree and it looks like something has rolled each like individual leaves up into like little cigars, then they're very intricate and they're, they're very well done. Uh, it's this creature, the females of these creatures uh, roll the leaves up and they lay the eggs. Um, and then this is another example of like where I, I got this blurry uh, bokeh background and then you can compare it with a boring black background that uh, you normally get in macro. So I just kind of give you an example of uh, what, 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 uh, what I'm trying to do with my pictures. Another amazing creature, uh, the Heteropoda David Bowie. So if a creature has another animal's name in it, it's, I think it's really cool. But if it's named after David Bowie, that's the coolest spider out of all of the, the, the huntsman spiders. And so these guys have an amazing orange color. Uh, they're endemic to Malaysia and they're uh, really uh, amazing every time we see them. I always have time for them. I love the patterning on their carapace as well. And any insight to why it's a name after David Bowie? Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know, what's interesting is um, if you look at jumping spiders in, in Malaysia, at least, or Southeast Asia, uh, they're almost always identified. Like the, some scientists have gone through and they've identified all of the jumping spiders and they've all got names and they're all described and they're very well documented. And then you get to huntsman spiders and they're like barely any of them seem to be identified. And you go on iNaturalist and it's like, none of them have species name, it's always genus. Uh, but this one, some, some crazy biologist came through and said, oh, it looks like David Bowie's the same color as his hair. So they need to head a report of David Bowie. And I, so I, I, I absolutely love them. I always have time for, to take a picture of these guys in the rainforest. Wow. Yeah, uh, is, just to add, um, yeah, yeah. the heteropoda David Bowie is named by Adam Yeager and an American scientist. Uh, I think he wa it was described in 2010, uh, although the spider has been around for a really long time and, you know, macro photographers in the past has been photographing them. Uh, mm -hmm. And another weird thing is that, yeah, Roy was saying how all, all the tiny little spiders have been described and it's very detailed. Uh, heteropoda are not exactly rare and they're very big as well. So it's, it is very strange that not a lot of people have been working on heteropoda and naming them. Yeah, they're really are, fast. Yeah. But one of the... One thing interesting I might I might add is maybe maybe with the discovery of um, digital photography it becomes a lot easier to take macro. Huh? Imagine trying to take this on film and you have no idea what your exposure is going to look like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. I even I even as you say you know like uh, with uh, digital photography it's you know like uh, mm -hmm. if you don't have a preview it's very difficult to gauge your exposure. It's sometimes you blow it out. Sometimes it's all you oh, know. Yeah. Sometimes it's completely off. Right? And you know, like I was saying, like I physically move back and like I set my focus, but then I physically move slightly mm. back and forth to get that plane of focus in the right spot. Mm. But so there's really, you have very little control over getting exactly on, on, on point. So with a digital photography, I can take 300 shots of one subject and I don't have to care. You know, but if this was film, I, I have no idea how you would do this. Like, so this is really, I think this is really something that could only have happened with digital photography. Uh, I don't know how they did it before this. Well, actually, I do. The Germans were really into macro photography. Uh, they were the first people that did it with film, and it was always like plants. So very cool, but you know, it's not as cool as heteropoda David Bowie. I'll put it that way. Um, <laughs> thank you. Okay, I, I, I really apologize if I'm going on too long. I'll try and speed this up. But like, thank you so much. By the way, just everyone tuning in. Like, I'm so thrilled anyone's interested in any of this. Um, so more, I just want to show you all the cool animals in Malaysia and like, you know, some of these pictures are good. They're like, I like them, but like, it's cooler the subject to know what the subject is. This is the trilobite beetle. Uh, this is an amazing example of something called neoteny. So this is uh, kind of like related to the firefly. So the males of this species uh, actually look like a normal, like 
beetle, firefly type thing. Uh, but the females um, never seem to grow past their larval stage. They just get bigger. So what you're seeing here is like the female of that species uh, crawling around and they, they of course called it the trilobite beetle. And it actually took them decades to find out uh, what the males looked like and they couldn't figure out um, like which, which species it actually was. Another interesting thing is I read this, they don't even know what, what the, uh, this thing doesn't seem to have mouth parts. So they, they don't seem to know what it eats or something. So I really bizarre creature, but it looks amazing. And uh, I always love it when I see it. It's very closely related to this firefly larva. Uh, again, the, the females uh, have this like like long larval stage, and they, they just seem to stay in it forever. And they even ha have the ability to glow in the larval stage. So um, you can see these uh, uh, like walking around the forest floor. And this is an interesting image that uh, Stephen helped me get by setting my. I he finally forced me to put my ISO past like two, 320 or something, and then uh, I had to hold the camera really still, turn the image stabilization on and uh, I can't even remember what else like the shutter speed was down to one over 100 and I was complaining bitterly about it um, but that's how you get that soft glow because otherwise it gets lost in the flash you can see here on the right like there's no glow so it's really hard to to show that creature's effect without uh, messing with your camera shutter. Uh, this is another amazing uh, spider called uh, Argyroides flavescens it actually goes onto the webs of larger spiders and then steals their prey right from underneath them. So it will actually hang out on their web and then it will wait for the other spider to inject it with venom and wrap it up and wait for the insect to die. And it will cut it out of that spider's web and gradually lower it onto their own web. So they steal prey from other spiders. Uh, so I came across this in Buka Gassing, knew what it was immediately and uh, started taking these pictures. I thought it was really uh, amazing to get to see this in real life. The interesting thing about this is that uh, it seems to be mimicking a dewdrop. That's why it's called the dewdrop spider. So you have these like reflective parts and then it's red because apparently a lot of animals and insects don't see in that spectrum. So um, for some reason it's got this amazing coloring but it's supposed to be mimicking a teardrop. More interesting spiders. Uh, this is a poultice genus. So this is poultice elevatus. And these, these spiders are absolutely remarkable because they mimic dead wood and uh, they look absolutely horrifying to most people. I mean, anyone, who has uh, arachnophobia, I think this is probably gonna be the, some of the most triggering species. And so Stephen and I came across these on a, a recent night safari and they're, they have amazing uh, body shapes and uh, highly uh, advanced camouflage. Another amazing insect, this is a, an assassin bug. And I, I haven't managed to ID what it is yet, but it's uh, an assassin bug that, that preys on ants and then it sticks the corpses of its victims onto its back. And what that does is they continue to release pheromones even though they're dead. And that tricks the other ants into thinking that it's just another one of them. So it's a really amazing uh, insect. And uh, getting this image, I think this is a focus stack, uh, trying to get all of the ants and the, the insect in focus. Another uh, picture that I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled by, and it was really difficult because it, it was just moving around all over the place. This is a velvet worm. Uh, this is a really amazing organism because it's an ancient, ancient organism. I mean, the, the ancestors of these were found in the earliest fossils of anything ever found. I mean, it's taxonomically distinct from almost everything else in the rainforest. And uh, they're really amazing creatures. This is almost like, like if when nature was trying to figure out how to make insects, this was like the first version of that. So they have a lot of the same characteristics as insects, but they do things in a really different way. You can see it resembles a centipede. But this is basically like a, a, the proto centipede. So it has like a slightly hard uh, chitinous exoskeleton, but uh, primitive eyes and antenna and uh, it's, it's soft bodied. So this is like nature's first uh, attempt and they're still alive. I didn't even know they were in Malaysia. So I uh, really thrilled to see this in the jungle. You can see the scale here. Uh, and it, it does actually feel a little soft like velvet and they have an amazing mouth part. So they have these altered uh, glands at the front that shoot slime over their, their prey. So they'll shoot slime out and it will trap the prey onto whatever substrate they're on and then they'll go after and eat it that way. Really amazing creatures. Uh, another really cool one, this is the beetle fly. It literally looks like a beetle and someone super glued a fly's head onto it. Uh, I still haven't gotten a good picture of one, but I just thought it was funny and I wanted to stick it in here. Uh, speaking of flies, this is uh, Megalobops quadrigatata, which is my probably my favorite Latin name of anything I've ever found. Um, and you can see there's a stalk-eyed fly and they have these bizarre eyes on the ends of stalks. 
that's normally found in predators, but these seem to have formed by natural selection. And some of the stalk-eyed flies, uh, like uh, Megalobop de honey. Anyway, there's another stalk-eyed fly, and it, the eyes are wider apart than the entire length of its body. So the, some absolutely uh, bizarre looking flies out here, and they look really cool. This is a uh, Orsimic pneumon. This is a jumping spider that seems to be a uh, wasp mimic. So you can see it's got a really holographic and reflective carapace and uh, its spinnerets are really elongated to mimic the mouth parts of a wasp. So uh, really amazing creature already. But the other cool thing is that it's one of like maybe three species of spiders we're aware of that's vegetarian or at least partially vegetarian because it actually uh, drinks the nectar from plants uh, that ants like to, like to eat from. And uh, so it's like only three species of spider that I'm aware of that are not only insectivorous, this, and this is one of them, and it's in Malaysia, really amazing. Uh, it's extremely expressive as well. Like it will go around waving its limbs and, and its hind legs, uh, doing a very good wasp mimic impression. Uh, I'm almost at the end here, but I just wanted to show you that this is the roadside near my apartment. So anyone out there who's thinking, oh, I, where do I find all these things? Well, this is just like a standard roadside near my apartment. Looks absolutely innocuous, really nothing amazing about it, but I found three different species of ant mimic jumping spider. I found Portia and I found um, the Amicia forticeps uh, crab, ant mimic crab spider. So all of these creatures were just found in like some in, you know, nondescript roadside near my house, which wasn't even like a good macro spot. So absolutely everywhere in Malaysia that you see jungle, there's bound to be something interesting in there. So anyone looking for things, I, I highly recommend you go out there and start getting your eye in there. Okay, I'm almost done, but first I want to show you one of the one of the images that really struck me uh, through my whole macro experience. Uh, and you're looking at it. It's it's just pure black, pure black image. And what this image is is I was taking pictures of a jumping spider, and then I saw this tiny little speck. I mean, absolutely, there was nothing there, but I, like it looked like a little full stop in a in a newspaper just flying in front of me but it was really stable. It was staying in one spot, not moving at all. And so for no real reason, I just kind of started trying to focus on it. And I was in manual focus. So you're just pointing your camera at it, moving back and forth. And I took like a dozen images, not really thinking about it. Didn't think anything of it at the time. And when I got home, I, I zoomed in. I, I kind of turned the exposure all the way up to maximum to try to see if I'd captured anything. And uh, I got this image and I cropped, this is like cropped in a, in an insane crop. And I got this image. And what you're looking at here is just, I mean, it's just a beetle, right? So it's just some tiny little beetle. It's probably one of the tiniest things I've ever photographed in mid flight, which was amazing to, for me to see. But on the back of that tiny little barely visible beetle is a mite. So even in the tiniest, most indes indescribably small things in the jungle, in the rainforest, there is an entire ecosystem going on and, and all these relationships and interactions between all of these creatures. And I captured that somehow on, on camera. And uh, I find that like just the sense of scale, like no matter how far you zoom in, something you're finding more things in nature. So what I like to tell people is that uh, nature is fractally interesting. So no matter how far you zoom in, you're still finding more and more things. And uh, this is one of the joys of, of macro photography for me. Okay, and on my last slide, uh, anyone who wants to follow me, I always like posting a lot of funny macro memes and um, pictures on Instagram. And this is where I post most of my work and anything else I'm up to related to my macro photography. So please feel free to follow me. Uh, I thank you so much for everyone for, for staying in. I was worried I was even gonna be able to get an hour worth of content and somehow uh, I've just been talking for almost two hours. So thank you so much to everyone for tuning in and uh, listening to my talk. And thank you guys for hosting me. Thank you, Roy. You, you, um, that was a fantastic presentation. I mean, you, you know, you're, and it's quite amazing that, you know, you've sort of like picked this up, like, you know, only when you came to Malaysia, which is barely four years ago. Huh? Mm. Uh, I mean, I've been living in Malaysia all my life and I'm so ashamed that, you know, I, I, I don't even know that we have such beautiful, wonderful diversity. Yeah. Like, uh, I'm yeah. very, um, uh, I mean, very inspired, you know, and, and, yeah. and you definitely know your stuff eh? or, or, you know, um, and, I'm uh, learning every day. And, but I really, I want to stress, like, if you're, if you're into nature, entomology, or even macro photography, I swear Malaysia is like one of the best countries in the world to live in for it. I mean, there's, 
you will never, I, I could live here the rest of my life doing macro photography. And I hope I do by the way, but um, I, I will never run out of, of, of things to take pictures of. And uh, this is one of the best countries in the world to do this in. Fantastic. Thank you so much. For, I, I, you know, like, uh, thank you for having me. It was a really, really good presentation. And, and, thank you. Thank you. And, and then, okay. you know, the, and then you made the talk so interesting, you know, like, uh, in, in actually going into the history and the nature of the things that you're taking and, and how you're taking it and sharing your equipment and sharing your, your insights. And, you know, like, I never knew we had a spider name after David Bowie in this country. Yeah? And uh, the fact that we have a spider that's a name of a snake, is it? That's name of that has a dog and a cat as well as a snake, you know, yeah, yeah. Yep. Part, part of his name. Yeah. Uh, I think that that is just like a mind blowing. Yeah? Amazing well, pictures, right? I'm, I'm, lo I'm looking at all the comments and uh, thank you so much for the compliments. That, that really means a lot to me coming from, you know, as, as someone who considers himself a hobbyist and amateur, like getting real photographers like yourself to, to give me compliments is uh, really, it like, it means a lot to me. But um, I, I wonder if there's any questions. How did uh, you oh, There's yeah. two in the chat. There's two questions in the chat. Okay. Uh, I can see one here. How do you do 30 photo stacking? If you go on YouTube and look at Photoshop photo uh, focus stacking, uh, you'll see some tutorials there, but uh, it's a fairly straightforward process. Um, I might even do a tutorial on it and load it to my Instagram account. So maybe just keep an eye on there and uh, I'll, I'll load a tutorial just for fun. Um, okay. Is there any other, have I ever been stung? No, I haven't, not yet, but in the last safari, uh, Stephen took a hit and there was a really angry wasp that uh, just dive bombed him and got him on the back of the neck, bless his heart. I have been eaten by leeches. Uh, leeches have been a feature of some of these uh, like hikes. I've gotten less terrified of leeches. They freaked me out at first, but um, they, I've kind of grown. I've grown. I've grown to be okay with them so far. Uh, oh yeah, Stephen answered that. I see. Like stung by a wasp. <laughs> yeah. It I saw Afia when I was taking my COVID, uh, my COVID jab mm -hmm. and I told her where I got stung by that wasp. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, thank you, Stephen. Stephen, whenever the wasp try and sting me, I point them to Stephen. I'm like, that's his job. They can go sting him. Uh, I've never been bitten by anything either. So, well, maybe the odd lizard or something, but you know, nothing poisonous. Before we uh, take any more questions, I think it's a good time for us to take a group photo, right? I definitely oh, yeah. need to remember this. And I'm like, you know, oh yeah, please do. Uh, uh, let me... Let me change my virtual background um, this way, yeah? back to this. Okay, cool. I mean, David okay. Bowie Spider. Wow. John, let's go to Tamar Rimba look for David Bowie Spider. Eh? <laughs> you, you, can, you can look for the deck, the dog and cat snake. Yes, I mean, I'm not into snakes. So. <laughs> okay. So guys, please turn on your camera. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Hi, Kevin. Okay, so look at the camera and I count three. Uh, one, two, three, smile. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> just like just, wow, just like picking so one of your things, huh? Joy, one, two, three, small, you know, you've got like a, a wiper. <laughs> so we're open for questions for Roy, please, uh, you know, feel free to uh, turn on your mics and like uh, address uh, Roy directly. Hi, nice to see you, Raymond. Hey, Roy. Uh, is there any other country? Now, you said you love Malaysia and you like staying in Malaysia in terms of macro photography, but is there like another country that you would be interested in visiting just for macro photography? Oh, I, we would be here all night if I listed them all. Um, <laughs> I, I actually, if you go on my Instagram account, you can, I, I don't, I'm a, I'm a really bad millennial. Um, I don't really know how to use Instagram. I'm just faking it, you know, um, which is why I'm uploading pictures of insects when everyone else has like pictures of themselves in bikinis on beaches. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I actually have like a wish list. So I keep track of like all the animals that I haven't or I want to take pictures of, and they're they're all over the world. Um, actually, on that note, uh, at one point in my life, this is going to be the biggest regret of my entire life, probably to date. But at one point in my life, I was lucky that I lived in South America, 
And uh, after a year of doing work out there, I took a couple months off to learn Spanish in Costa Rica. And all I really did was go surfing and, you know, go party and like learn Spanish. And now as a, as a hobby naturalist and macro photographer, I just, you know, I want to like, I want to go back and kick myself because that's one of the best countries in the world to do uh, macro photography. And they have uh, the frogs alone would be worth the trip to go out there. Um, yeah, uh, Costa Rica would be great. Obviously, I actually went to the Amazon at one point. And again, uh, I was really lucky. Uh, I had the opportunity to go there for a week. And again, all I did was kind of, I did a little bit of like naturalist stuff. I saw some pink dolphins. That was really cool. Um, but, you know, like what a waste. I mean, you know, like macro photographer Roy is really upset at 20 year old, you know, 20, Roy in his 20s for wasting that incredible opportunity. But here we are, you know, you live and learn, you know. Yeah, Costa Rica would be one. Uh, oh man, so many places. Uh, yeah, at the the Amazon. Uh, yeah, and if you look at my wish list on Instagram, you'll see. Uh, I I guarantee you'll be you'll be interested to see some of those spiders there. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Oh, questions, please. Okay. Wow. Yeah. You know, Roy, uh, that night when we were out and when you photographed that velvet worm, right? Uh, I thought I had decent pictures of it in the past. Mm. So I didn't try very hard to photograph that velvet worm. But, you know, with MCO, I had some time to look into my hard drives, right? So I found those pictures again of the ones that I photographed in the past and they sucked. <laughs> Oh no. oh no. So I really regretted not trying very hard on oh, that particular no. world. So, yeah, yeah, actually, you know, one of the funny things about photography that I've learned is that there's this weird thing that happens. Like if I go, if I find a subject in the jungle and I take pictures, like the pictures will be good, but they're never as good as if I go away and do something else. And then I find the subject again and then have another go at taking pictures of it. And I have no idea why. I have no idea why that that would be. But um, the pictures I took of the velvet were were better after I'd kind of given myself like a moment away, and then I took some some more pictures. But um, you know, I didn't even know those were in Malaysia, and they were they were like really high on my wish list. So I, I nearly fainted when we saw that. I, I, I honestly, I I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. You know. I tell you what, I'm going to digress a bit now because I see Richard Richards here. So just a bit of backstory. Yesterday, we found out that Richard actually does printing and he lives quite close to me. Eh? So like uh, actually like I uh, printed uh, one of his, one of my photo, one of my prints uh, with Richard today. Eh? Look at it. What size is this, uh, Richard? A2, I think. Uh, A2, yeah. yeah. A2, A2 eh? and then it's a canvas print. Eh? So, so wow, you know, like uh, under MCO, these are one of the things I can do, you know. Because I'm actually going through my hard drive and like, you know, like curating some of my photos and thinking what I, you know, like, and, and when I found out that, you know, he's just like in section 17, I'm in Tamantun, eh? this is 10 minutes away. Eh? So I'm very, very happy, you know, so really let's, let's try and, you know, like, uh, you know, print some of our photos. Uh, Roy, you've got lots of, you know, fantastic, uh, you know. Uh, well, I've thought about printing them off, but, yeah, you know, I would, I would probably just realized the white balance was off and then I'd want to get it reprinted again and you know <laughs> a, a picture is never finished it's merely abandoned you know <laughs> or do what I do just turn everything to monochrome man eh? so you don't have to worry about my balance <laughs> genius genius I, I don't know why I didn't think of that <laughs> and then you missed uh Kevin's been giving us a, a you know like classes on like photography and I think one of the one of the things that we talked about is the you know uh, you know one of the reasons you know you actually like uh um uh shoot and uh you know present your photos in monochrome eh? mm -hmm. uh it's a very i think you know you spent like two hours on that subject but i think there's actually a lot of like academic uh reasons why you do that eh? so if you can look back at one of our look at back at our videos you see eh? we actually did a series on like monochrome and printing and how you edit it eh? uh, yeah no i i, I kind of wish i knew about this group before because i would have loved to have seen what other photographers are up to, but I will be definitely be tuning in on more of these in the future. So really, uh, I'm thrilled to not only know about you guys, but um, to have been able to present to you here. Definitely tune in tomorrow because we have... Uh... Oh yeah, oh man, yeah, I can't wait, like love it. Even is gonna be showing us uh, 
of let's see this steven's going to be showing us like uh things that he's taken in uh bukit kiara which is just behind my backyard yeah, yeah. so like uh one day i'm going to go with john you know and have his coffee and tea and you know <laughs> try not to you know take anything too poisonous with steven yeah? don't worry you'll be entirely safe yeah. It's it's not every day that we see venomous snakes. I have to try very hard to find some. <laughs> but one thing, Stephen, you have to know something about me. I cannot run very fast. <laughs> uh, don't worry. I'm at a, I'm a bit it. of a disadvantage. Eh? <laughs> You'll be in no danger. Don't worry. <laughs> so yeah, uh, my last photo jam, I threw all of my, all of my best work in that. Uh, so this time around, I think uh, uh, the reptiles and amphibians that I'll be showing tomorrow is very specific to the ones that are found in uh, Bukit Kiara. So a lot of them are the slightly more common ones. Uh, some of them are not as flashy as uh, the other snakes that I showed. But I think they are still interesting to see and know about because, you know, they are our neighbors. Literally for you, you live so close to Bukit Kiara. And I think uh, there's quite a number of other photographers here that live around the area, right? I think uh, this would greatly benefit you uh, yeah, to, to know what's around Bukit Kiara. It's fantastic. Uh, I can't wait. Uh, lots to share tomorrow. <laughs> you know, on that note, it's amazing because I've, I've been on Stephen's uh, Bukit Kiara night safari dozens and dozens of times. And every single night was different. Like we would see different things and we'd find different creatures and all kinds. It, yeah, it's going to be amazing. I, I can't wait. Can't wait. <laughs> Thanks. Um. Uh, okay, Roy. I, 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 I like uh, the, your photos, those, especially those with a uh, nice bouquet and a little bit of artistic feel. Mm -hmm. I like this, that type of photo. Those, uh, the others, like a lot of spiders, insects, all those things. I think it's a bit creepy for ladies. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about <laughs> others, but personally, okay, I, I, I find it uh, a little bit um, scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but those those with you know very very nice color plain and and bouquets or those uh, are really very lovely and i i was looking through your instagram photos <laughs> and there's really a lot of photos yeah, and yeah. i really like the ones you took in philippines of the the diving photo in oh philippines. yeah 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 I... those are so amazing oh, how, how can it's re there are really so many uh, types of coral fishes, uh, all those mm. in Philippines. I I'm so surprised you mm. you've managed to find so many. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I actually named my Instagram account Roy the Dive Bro as like a joke because I thought I thought that was what I was going to upload is like diving underwater diving mm. pictures. But you know, hilariously, I, that was only a small part of what I did. But um, I think there's yeah. There, I, oh my God! There's so many great underwater photographers to I can yes, recommend you guys. Yes, wow. that that is uh, I think must be the place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah the, the underwater photography is uh, amazing, and uh, I love how they embrace the abstract. And I, I that's mm -hmm. absolutely it's that's in my blood. I love that. I love that kind of mm -hmm. photography. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are very colorful. So cannot turn into black and white. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Well, sometimes people do, but I always feel like what a shame. You know, like that's that. You know, uh, part of them. They, they're yeah. very beautiful uh, stuff under there. They're very beautiful. Thank yes. You. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I, so is that um? Anybody else have any questions for for Roy tonight? Okay, I think we are good for now. Thank you okay. so much, Roy. I think it's been a fantastic uh, set of photos that you've shared with us. Really, you know, like, uh, mm. and and uh, you're so knowledgeable about that photos. I think that that's that's what's inspiring. Many times we see a lot of photos with no backstory, but you seem to have a story for every single photo that you show, you took, eh? and you actually took the trouble to actually try to pronounce the Latin names. So. <laughs> You know, yeah, pop yeah. marks for effort, nah? right? Thank you so much, and thank yeah. you all very much for having me. I'm absolutely humbled to uh, have presented to you for so long and for people to be interested. So thank you so much for uh, having me on. 
thank you you know and then royce do like uh, join us every evening every evening sure 8 30 will. we'll be on yeah sure thing sure thing thank you very much i will do okay. cool okay thank you everyone thank you everybody thank, thank you so much Roy. Yeah. Yeah. thank you good night everybody thank you Roy. good night everyone good night good night good night, good night. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you tomorrow. Okay. Stay yeah. safe. Yeah. See you tomorrow. <laughs> bye. See you tomorrow, Steven. All right. See you, Lucy. Bye bye. Oh, Lang Good night, Lang Good night, June. Good night. Good night. Bye bye. Good night. 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 Good